Hi y'all! So I talked a lot about gut and psychology syndrome and the microbiome hijack uh, on my last video and I wanted to come on today to talk more about what we do about it. So hopefully you're convinced that the microbiome hijack is a very real thing that a lot of people are dealing with, uh, but it's important to know what to do. Um, and I do follow a lot of Dr. Natasha Campbell McBride's uh, recommendations in her gut and psychology book and gut and physiology book. Those are incredible resources. There's tons of stuff online, both from her and from GAPS practitioners um, and just families that have seen success uh, doing the GAPS diet. So I use uh, a very similar diet to that in my practice um, with, you know, a few more specific uh, things as well. Um, basically, the most important thing to do is to rebuild the gut lining and the immune system. So the gut lining needs to be repaired if you want to repair the microbiome because when it is leaky, you can be putting all the good healthy bacteria and nutrients into your body that you want, but it may not actually be getting received, right? It might be going through the perforations in the gut lining. There's no like nice, soft, healthy gut lining for good bacteria to nest in. Um, it's just um, not always super helpful. And this is why some people go on these kind of generalized gut repair diets that you'll see around. And um, it doesn't do much, right? Because you need to really seal that gut lining first. Um, and uh, when you have an overgrowth of uh, bacteria in your gut, uh, the toxins from that uh, can be really harsh on your gut lining. And so part of it is not only needing to uh, cut off the fuel source of those overgrown microbes, but also intake a lot of the nutrients that's going to seal the lining of the gut. So this is not only about what you eat, but also what you don't eat. Both of these are equally important. The other thing that I think is important to note is I try not to have my clients get caught up too much on their GI testing. Um, a lot of people really want to know like, well, if I have a chronic infection, I want to know what it is so I know how to proceed. And there's nothing wrong with getting a stool test to see what types of bacteria might show up on it. But honestly, it doesn't give a lot of really helpful information for the most part. Um, so first of all, you can't always tell what's going on in the gut from analyzing the stool, right? Because they're different places. <laughs> Sometimes you're not getting an actual, actual picture of what's going on in the gut by the time the stool gets out of the body, right? There's a lot of things that can happen <laughs> through that whole transit and it's not always an accurate picture. That's why people will get two different tests that will show totally different things sometimes. Um, Sometimes it can be helpful to see, especially people who really want to like see something on a piece of paper, you know, to feel good about something. You can, but honestly, it really doesn't give a lot of helpful information for most people. Um, the other thing is that people often get caught up on like the exact type of microbe they have that is overgrown. And there have been a lot of studies done in places all over the world where they have taken a lot of these GI samples from people to see what their microbiome looked like. And again, there are some problems with that not necessarily being super accurate. But one thing they found is that in populations that are living traditionally that are extremely healthy, they have all these pathogenic strains, what we would think of as pathogenic strains of microbes, things like strep and E. coli, things that we would think of as just like bad bacteria. These very healthy people have these strains. And so even though I often will use terms like good bacteria and bad bacteria, I, I hesitate, right? Because it's not that clear cut. It seems to not be so much what kinds of bacteria you have in the gut, it seems to be the context of your internal ecosystem, right? Are they in proper ratio with the other microorganisms that are keeping an overall healthy ecosystem? So you can have a very pathogenic strain of microbe. It's more about the ratios of the microbe and microbes all together and the strength of your overall immune system. So if you are feeling great and you're still testing with some of these microbes, it doesn't mean you have to keep doing kill protocols. In fact, you probably shouldn't. Um, so this is part of the reason I don't always recommend uh, stool testing is because 
it cannot be super accurate um, it can also give people kind of a faulty idea of you know there being particular bad strains and particular good strains although there definitely are certain bacteria strains that we do want to see um, the um, lactobacillus and the bifidobacterium all of these are very important strains to have in the gut but it doesn't tell us so much about like what strains we don't want to see if that makes sense um so a lot of these diets you will see that promote gut health they tend to be very high in fiber and starch you'll see a lot like eat a lot of fiber and eat a lot of whole grains to heal your gut and the reason that this has been promoted is because there's been these epidemiological studies where they look at people in the western world who tend to be in really good health and tend to have what we would think of as you know indications of a healthy gut right they have good digestive health they have good mental health um, all of these kinds of things right they have good immune health um, and it just so happens <laughs> that in Western culture, people that tend to have healthy practices, people that tend to eat whole foods diets and exercise and don't drink or smoke, all of these kinds of things, they also tend to be people that eat a lot of vegetables and whole grains, right? Uh, and you can totally be healthy eating a lot of vegetables and whole grains. There are a lot of traditional societies that do something similar. But this is not the only way to have a healthy gut because we also see in traditional societies there are tribes that are mostly carnivore that uh, also have very healthy guts they eat almost no starch or whole grains or they literally eat none right and they also have healthy guts so there's been this weird correlation we've gotten in our medical system in our kind of conventional nutrition system where we have associated fiber and resistant starch with a healthy gut because those tend to be the people with healthy guts <laughs> in our culture but that doesn't mean it's universally true now I also like to point out that what promotes a healthy gut when you already have a healthy gut versus what promotes a healthy gut when you don't have a healthy gut are also two very different things. So if you already have a really good balance of microbes in your gut, then eating a lot of the foods that are going to promote that growth can be very helpful. So eating uh, traditional starches, things like plantains and cassava flowers and beans and whole grains, these are all things that are consumed by a lot of traditional cultures who tend to have very good health. Uh, but they are coming into the world with a healthy immune system and a healthy microbiome in the first place. They're just feeding that balance. Now, the problem is, is that uh, when we want to reset the microbiome, we have to take away the fuel for the microbes that are overgrown. And the microbes that overgrow feed on starch and sugar. And so until we get your symptoms to a place where we are seeing that your microbiome is really balanced, uh, then we really want to be extremely diligent about having no starch in the diet at all. Um, we also want to be careful with fiber, even if it's not the kind of fiber that is in resistant starches, even if it's like the kind of fiber that's in like, um, you know, uh, nuts and seeds and uh, some of the more fibrous vegetables, you know, things like kale or broccoli. Um, even though these things will not feed bacterial overgrowth, they can be really harsh on the gut lining. So again, if you have a healthy gut lining, fiber can be great. It actually can be very detoxifying, very cleansing for the body. Um, again, a lot of traditional people eat these foods all the time and they're in great health. But they're not coming to the table with a leaky gut, right? Or perforations in their gut lining. So if we are trying to seal the gut, we need to think infant formula, right? We need to think baby food. We need to think first introductions because we're really starting you over, right? Saying, okay, that didn't work the first time around. Let's rebuild the gut from the bottom up. Let's reseal the lining of the gut. And so we wanna take away fiber. So we don't wanna do any kind of like nuts or seeds. And we only want to eat vegetables that are um, very, very well cooked so that they're not harsh and scraping along the lining of the gut causing damage. So that's why we do the soup diet uh, that a lot of my clients have heard me talk about. Uh, a lot of people have been following me have heard me talk about, but basically it's all very soft and warm and nourishing foods. So that's what we want to uh, really promote in terms of taking things out, you know, not a lot of harsh uh, fiber um, and uh, no resistant starch or sugars or things that are going to feed the bacterial overgrowth. Um, 
we do want to add certain things. so when we are rebuilding the immune system, we definitely want to focus on an animal-based diet and some people get confused when they have had tests come up where they show that they have the types of gram-negative bacteria overgrowth that is fed by animal fats but my concern with this is that we also need animal fats to rebuild the immune system and the nervous system and as we rebuild the immune system the body will balance those out naturally right if we give uh starch uh it also feeds that right so it's kind of a no-win situation <laughs> so in that case uh, i encourage people to trust the rebuilding of their immune system to take care of that in the long term uh, and animal foods are going to have the fat-soluble vitamins that are essential for our immune system. Um, Weston A. Price, who is very well known in the uh, nutrition world, uh, the ancestral nutrition world, um, he found that especially vitamin A was this like X factor that uh, really was correlated with the people he found around the world living traditionally who were in the best health. And he was really... Um, uh, correlating tooth health and tooth decay with overall health and when he came back to the Western world what he found was that when he had children with very poor dental health which indicated poor overall health uh, he would give them uh, a mixture of concentrated butter specifically from cows who had been grazing on spring pastures and cod liver oil and he would give them this mixture and he would see immediate turnaround in these children's health and so there's a similar thing going on with this very animal-based, soft, nourishing diet that I use to reset the gut. Um, it uh, has all of these nutrients that Weston A. Price was finding to be so effective in, in the children that he was working with. Um, fermented foods are also very important because we want to introduce a lot of uh, good little bacteria soldiers. <laughs> we want to introduce uh, the good bacteria, uh, the strains I was talking about earlier, the lactobacillus, the bifidobacterium, uh, that are going to create a really strong, robust immune system. Uh, even if we're not eating resistant starch to feed them, it seems to be that they, uh, the, the really healthy strains uh, can still uh, thrive in the gut, even when we don't have any any resistant starch in the diet. Um, we've seen this because we see children eating carnivore diets for years who are severely ill and just have continued improvements in their health even years and years and years of not eating any resistant starch. We also see this in um, some traditional societies that are mostly carnivore, um, places like the uh, Inuit or the Maasai. Um, there's other examples as well uh, where they are really having no resistant starch in the diet and they have very healthy, robust uh, gut microbiomes. Um, so there's more complexity here than a lot of people are acknowledging and we can see that in case studies and we can see that in traditional cultures. Uh, I also uh, tend to uh, suggest that people stick to this for a fairly long time, uh, a fairly long time by our standards today. <laughs> In the body, this is actually a very short time, right? If you think about a lifespan of, you know, uh, 70, 80, 90 years, uh, it really is a blink. Uh, but it can take up to two years to fully reset the microbiome. Now, this depends on the severity of the illness. People who are coming with more mild imbalances can sometimes get away with six months to a year, uh, but people who have been sick since they were very young, which is a lot of the gut and psychology syndrome type people, uh, it's really a two-year process, maybe a year and a half. Um, and so, uh, again, it seems like a long time from our standards when we're used to doing these like one month reset, you know, and I've, I've fallen into that too. Like that's what tends to sell or, or get promoted or people feel uh, more confident about, but really that's just enough time to scratch the surface. Um, it's not enough time to do a full reset. And so it's really more of a one to two years uh, type of situation. Um, so, uh, if you want more details about exactly how to do this, food lists, things like that, I do have some free videos if you scroll back to the very beginning of my YouTube channel uh, where I go through um, 
the stages of the diet. i made them a while ago, so you know i sometimes make adjustments in how i prone it now, but it definitely has the basic structure i also have an online course that's self-guided that has you know each stage food list, shopping list, recipes extra tips a lot of really comprehensive guidance about how to go through this, so i encourage you to check out my online course on my website and then also, i'm announcing it here for the first time, i'm going to announce it on my website and on my social medias not until next month but i am going to be starting at the beginning of february, so for the whole month of february i'm going to be doing a group gut reset uh, so this is just going to be that first month that is the most restrictive where it's really just the soup diet for the full four weeks and um, we're all going to do it together uh, so that everyone has that community support because it is really hard and like I was saying in the video I posted uh, last time uh, you have a lot of times these intense sensory issues and these really strong cravings and all these other factors that make it really really difficult to be successful so I really want to promote this group support, so we'll meet on Zoom weekly uh, and I'll go through it together and then uh, in the last week I'll uh, give guidance about how to keep moving forward with it uh, for people who want to continue it. So um, look out for the signups on that, I'll be making more announcements about it later. Uh, but I hope this was a helpful starter guide.